the Narrow Path radio program, hosted by Steve Gray. Steve is not in the studio today, so calls from listeners will not be able to be taken. In the place of the usual format, we've put together some of the best calls from past programs. They cover a variety of topics important to anyone interested in the Bible and Christianity. In addition to the radio program, The Narrow Path has a website you can go to, www.thenarrowpath.com, where you can find hundreds of resources that can all be downloaded for free. And now, please enjoy this special collection of calls to Steve Gregg and The Narrow Path. All right, our first caller today is Rick, calling from Laguna Beach. Rick, welcome to The Narrow Path. Thanks for calling. Uh, good morning. Uh, yeah, I'd like to know your opinion and definition of uh, the emergence church, and is it a threat to the uh, uh, body of Christ? Well, uh, some people think it's a threat to the body of Christ. It's very hard to define the emergent church because it's not exactly a denomination. It's more like a, a type of church. Uh, and there are churches all over the country that would regard themselves to be in the stream of uh, the emergent church, or, or sometimes the emerging church. There's, there, there are actually two different streams now. I don't know the difference between them. One calls itself the emerging church and one the emergent church, but they both used to be terms for the same movement. So this movement is diversifying even more as time goes by. It isn't really uh, a movement that has any official leadership. A man named Brian McLaren used to be kind of the uh, unofficial spokesperson for many of the people in the movement, but he, you know, he's not appointed or elected to any official position. The emergent church uh, and churches that regard themselves to be in that stream are seeking to be relevant to what they call the postmodern culture. Now, the postmodern society is said to be what we now find among the young people in the Western world. We used to have the modern culture, which was about science and reason, and the postmodern culture is more, a lot more about uh, meaning and feeling. In many cases, uh, one of the most objectionable things about postmodernism is that uh, you know the, the denial that there's any such thing as absolute truth. Now, I wouldn't say necessarily that all churches that are of the emergent church would deny there's absolute truth. I can't answer for all of them, but. It certainly is the case that the churches that regard themselves as emergent are trying to be relevant to the postmodern culture. And this does mean they're rethinking many things that were for a long time regarded as indisputable truths. They're borrowing, in some cases, some uh, disciplines from the Eastern Church or the Church of the East, some of the old desert fathers and so forth. Certain forms of prayer and meditation are being introduced. There is some tendency to underplay doctrinal orthodoxy, which does not mean that all the emergent church people are unorthodox, but that they are not necessarily insisting upon uh, orthodoxy in some areas. Uh, for example, I mean, uh, you might find an emergent pastor who believes in the Trinity, but who does not believe that the Trinity is, a, is an issue to be, to be pushed uh, with people. He might believe the Trinity is true, but not, not one of the central doctrines that needs to be, uh, you know, pushed, and, he, uh, and other Christian doctrines like that, too. So a lot of people feel the emergent church is simply too wishy-washy about their theology, and um, some people are very concerned about some of their practices, like the contemplative prayer movement, which they, they practice, which is some people feel is a little too close to Eastern meditation. Uh, but there are, of course, defenders of these uh, aspects of the church, too. It, do I think it's a danger to the church, the emergent movement? Well, I think there are perhaps some things that, that, that we need to watch out for in that movement. Unfortunately, I would say that lots of different denominations are a danger to the church in terms of uh, institutionalizing uh, the church and, uh, and uh, maybe giving a truncated or a, a lopsided presentation of the gospel. I think lots of denominations are guilty of that. Uh, the emergent church isn't a denomination, but I suppose uh, one could find areas of imbalance in it and exactly how dangerous that is to the church, I can't really say. Uh, I, I, we could ask, for example, even about cults. Uh, 
and I'm not saying that the emerging church is a cult, but let's, let's just say Jehovah's Witnesses. We believe that they definitely are wrong in their theology and so forth. Are they a danger to the church? Well, they're a danger to the church if they persuade church people to depart from Christian uh, you know, beliefs. But uh, if Christians are warned, or well, let's just say if Christians are well trained in their Christian beliefs, then a visit from the Jehovah's Witnesses is not going to be a threat to them. And likewise, I think if a person is well trained in their Christian beliefs, you know, the emergent church is not going to be a threat to them. So uh, there's all kinds of dangers of different kinds, I suppose, to the church. I don't know that I would identify the emergent church as one of the principal ones, but it would it may be something to keep your eye on and see how far they go. Unfortunately, although I found that Brian McLaren, who is fairly respected in the movement, uh, was uh, wrote in some of his early books things I found refreshing and I could agree with. Uh, as time went on, he, he moved further and further away from Christian, even Christian morality. Not that he's living an immoral life, but that he's approving of things that Christianity would regard as immoral, particularly same-sex marriage and things like that. So um, there are definitely, there, there's some drift in that movement in a direction that I don't think is safe or good. Thank you, sir. Okay, Rick, thanks for your call. Good talking to you. Theo from St. Petersburg, Florida. Welcome to the Narrow Path. Thanks for calling. Hello, Steve. I, um, Hi, Theo. Thanks. I, I was listening to an uh, uh, older program of yours, and uh, you were having a conversation with a caller, and you a couple of times you reiterated the following that... Um, because I guess there was a question concerning Calvinism or Arminianism, and I think you concluded by saying you can't imagine what difference it would have on you, it would have on you, and I guess practically speaking, as a Christian, whether which view you you, you held to, and um, I, I don't know if I want, needed you to clarify that because I I thought of them right away when I. Okay, tell me, tell me what difference it would make for you, because the way I see it is following Jesus is easily defined by simply reading, for example, what Jesus taught. Now, Calvinism and Arminianism are different opinions about what took place behind the scenes in the secret councils of God that lead me to become a disciple or not. You know, the Calvinist says, well, you were predestined from the foundation of the world to be a disciple, and that's why you are one. The, Calvin, or the Arminian says, no, not necessarily. You had free choice in the matter, and that's why you're a Christian. But either way, both agree that Christianity is following Jesus. So if I was a, a Calvinist, I would believe in following Jesus. If I'm an Arminian, I believe in following Jesus. We, I might have right, a different opinion than, than another man does about what secretly was done behind the scenes, but how, how, how does that have any practical value to me? Right, but if I was convinced of, so let's say, Calvinism, to me it seems more deterministic, more fatalistic. And right. if, say, if I was um, considering whether I should give in to a sin or not, I would say, well, if it was God's will for me to resist this, then I would not, I would not give in. So why, why even put up the effort? You know, what I'm I saying understand. Because I think, yeah, I understand. But see, that's that doing so would be allowing your moral behavior to be dictated by your theology instead of by the commands of Christ. See, if my theology is I'm either going to sin or not because I'm predestined to do so or not, well. So I might as well just do it. No, that's the wrong answer. I mean, even if I believed that I am predestined either to sin or not to sin, I still have a command not to do it. So I would have to avoid and resist temptation. Whether I, and if I fell and I was a Calvinist, I might say, well, I guess, I guess God, uh, you know, that was predestined that I would fail in this case. But I'm supposed to keep trying. And, you know, my... I realize what you're saying, that if I don't keep trying, then I was predestined not to. If I, if I just become a total uh, lazy person and don't serve God, that's because I was pre predestined not to. Everything was predestined. I, I understand that. I understand that a person's philosophical or theological uh, commitments could evaporate their motivations, you know. But mm -hmm. at the same time, we live our lives as Christians not by what our theological presuppositions about those things are, but by the fact that Jesus is our Lord and we obey him. 
And therefore, if I was a Calvinist, I would still believe my obligation is to obey Jesus. And that's what I would endeavor to do. If in the back of my mind, I thought, yeah, in the, you know, if I fail in this, God predestined it. <clears throat> well, then that would make me think God's not very nice to tell me to do something and then to force me to do something else. But at the same time, it wouldn't change the way I, I'm, I, I see myself as obligated to live. And by the way, there's lots of Calvinists, lots of Calvinists who live very godly, holy lives. And right, I right. say, well, why, I, would, they, found why would they bother to do that? You know? who I felt was consistent with their theology, but <laughs> but yeah. Um, but yeah, I understand what you're saying. Yeah. A lot of people live better than their theology. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, that was, and, that was my and, only question. Okay. And ultimately, we'll be judged by what we do, not what we imagine to be the case behind the scenes. Okay. Very good, Steve. Okay, Theo. Thank thanks you. for your call. Good talking to you. All right. Uh, let's talk to uh, Chris from Sacramento. Uh, two in a row from Sacramento. Hi, Chris. Welcome. Yeah. Hi, Steve. Hey, I have a question for you from 1 Corinthians chapter 14, uh, like after verse 21 or 22. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Paul is talking about... Sounds like a contradiction, uh, doesn't it? Yeah, a little bit. It, so yeah. can you help me with uh, actually the whole body of it? Uh, the question about uh, uh, tongues being a sign for whom, um, and then also the prophecy. Because, I mean, it seems to mm -hmm. say it's not a... Uh, not a sign for unbelievers, but then he seems to describe a situation where it is. So right. that, that's what I'm sounds gonna, contradictory. Yeah, right. Uh, so would you kind of explain over that whole little chunk of scripture for me, and I'll just listen uh, over the radio. Okay, I'll work on it. All right, God bless. You, okay, Chris. God bless. All right. Um, this is a case where Paul says one thing in one verse and seems to outright contradict himself in the next verse. And some people have found it so troublesome that they feel like they can't harmonize it. In fact, uh, there's one translation of the Bible, the Phillips translation, where he just makes the two verses agree arbitrarily and artificially, and he has a footnote. And it's the only, it's the only footnote in the whole translation, the Phillips translation. And he says, I have taken the liberty of changing what Paul said here because he clearly contradicted himself. That's how notorious it is. But uh, I don't think he contradicted himself necessarily. I think that we can understand his uh, thoughts if we understand that he believed in tongues being operating in more than one way and that the word sign is being used of one use of tongues, but not of the other. He says in verse 22, 1 Corinthians 14, 22, therefore tongues are for a sign not to those who believe, but to unbelievers. So he says, tongues is a sign to unbelievers. But prophesying is not for unbelievers, but for those who believe. So as tr in terms of a sign, tongues is a sign to unbelievers. So we see that on the day of Pentecost, of course, uh, that the people spoke in tongues and the unbelievers heard them. And it was a sign to them that something supernatural was happening. They wondered what's going on here. And Peter explained it gave him a chance to preach the gospel to them. So this miraculous speaking in other languages that the speakers had never learned and did not know uh, was a sign of a supernatural thing happening, and the unbelievers, it got their attention. So tongues was a sign, not to those who believe, but to unbelievers. But he says, but prophesying is not for unbelievers, but for those who believe. But the next verse then he says, therefore, if the whole church comes together in one place and all speak with tongues, and there comes in those who are uninformed or unbelievers, will they not say that you are out of your mind? But if all prophesy and an unbeliever or an uninformed person comes in, he is convinced by all. He's judged by all. Now, it sounds like he's saying the opposite of what he said in verse 22. In verse 23, he says, if unbelievers come into your assembly and you're all speaking in tongues. Now, he, he just said in verse 22 that tongues is a sign for the benefit of unbelievers. He says, now, if unbelievers come in and you're all speaking in tongues, they're going to think you're nuts. You're out of your mind. But he had said that prophecy is a sign for believers. Yet he says in verse 24, if all prophesy an unbeliever and an uninformed person comes in, he's convinced and judged by all. That's a good thing. Now, one possibility is that which uh, the Phillips translation takes. And that is that we don't have the passage unaltered. From time to time, 
you have uh, a copyist error that does creep into some of the passages. Not that Paul made the mistake, but that somebody copying 1 Corinthians a long time ago made the mistake. They were careless and, and put it in wrong. And then it was copied that way, and then that one was copied that way, and so forth, until it became the version that we have based on a mistake that somebody made while copying it, that Paul didn't make the mistake, but someone, anonymous copyist did, and it's come down to us that way. If that is so, then the suggestion that Phillips made, J.B. Phillips in his Phillips translation, was that verse 22 should read the opposite of what it says. And it's not impossible that Paul did write it the opposite way and that some copyists did make this mistake. It says, therefore, tongues are for a sign not to those who believe, but to unbelievers. Possibly, Paul had it the other way around. Tongues are for a sign not to unbelievers, but to believers. But prophecy, he says, is not for unbelievers, but for those who believe. He could have had it the other way. Prophecy is not for those who believe, but those who don't believe. Um, that is a possibility, but it still doesn't work out very well because it's not true that way. It is not true that tongues are a sign to believers and not unbelievers. Because like I said, on the day of Pentecost, they were indeed a sign to the unbelievers, just like, just like it reads in our versions right here. Likewise, to say that prophecy is not for believers, but for unbelievers, that's not true either. Because throughout this entire chapter, Paul's arguing that prophecy edifies the church, meaning the believers. And he said that tongues can edify the believers too, if it has an interpretation. But to change this, to say that Paul wrote it the opposite, would make him say things that are simply not true, namely that God doesn't use tongues as a sign to unbelievers, but he did. And that prophecy is not for believers, but it is. So how do we harmonize all this? I think that what he's saying is this. Uh, throughout the First Corinthians 14, I think Paul recognizes there's three different uses of tongues. One of them is for the edification of the church. And it is for Christians. But it needs the gift of interpretation. He says in, in chapter 14, verse 2, He who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God, for no one understands him. However, in the Spirit he speaks mysteries. But he says later on that uh, in verse 5, I wish you all spoke with tongues, but even more that you prophesied. For he who prophesies is greater than he who speaks in tongues, unless indeed he interprets that the church may receive edification. So Paul says there's a place for speaking in tongues in the church that is for the church, that edifies the church if it's interpreted. Now, that's not the same thing as tongues being assigned to the unbelievers. Why? Because what Paul's describing in the opening verses of 1 Corinthians 14 is people speaking in a language that no one understands. It has to be interpreted by a supernatural gift. It is spoken supernaturally, and it is interpreted supernaturally. These are separate gifts of the Holy Spirit, tongues and interpretation. So he's talking about something that isn't assigned to unbelievers, but is an edifying gift for the church to happen in the church for the believers. It requires because the speaking in tongues is a language no one understands, it requires a gift of interpretation. However, there is a, such a thing as tongues that's a sign to unbelievers. But that was not in a case where no one understood it, and there was no interpretation needed, because they spoke in languages that were known to the audience. The unbelievers heard things in their own languages. There was no gift of interpretation needed, and there was they were not speaking things that no one understood. So Paul sees two different uses of tongues right there, one being uh, that which is a sign for the unbelievers, which actually is speaking in the language of the unbelievers, which they understand, and there's no interpretation needed. But then there's another speaking in tongues that is for the church. It's not a language that anyone understands, and it needs to be interpreted for the edification of the church, which is a different issue than assigned to unbelievers. And then there's one other thing, and that is that Paul's talking about speaking in tongues in the church in verse 27 and 28. He says, if anyone speaks in a tongue, let it be by two or at the most three, each in turn, and let one interpret. So he's talking about that kind of tongues that needs to be interpreted. Verse 28, but if there's no interpreter, let him keep silent in the church and let him speak to himself and to God. In other words, without an interpretation, tongues is of no use to the church. So don't speak it out in the church, but you can speak it privately to yourself and to God, you can devotionally speak in tongues on your own. 
there is such thing as praying in an unknown tongue. Paul speaks about it. He says, I, I speak in tongues more than you all. But he says, but in the church, I don't. He said, in the church, I'd rather speak f- five words in an intelligible way than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. Now, notice he says, I don't speak in tongues in the church. I speak intelligibly in the church. But alone, I speak in tongues more than all of you. So Paul recognizes a speaking in tongues that is personal and private, devotional, speaking to God on your own. There's also a speaking in tongues that is the language of an unbeliever and serves as a sign to the unbeliever. Then there's a speaking in tongues that edifies the church, but no one understands it, so they need a gift of interpretation. Paul recognizes all three of those. Now, in verse 22, which you raised a question about, he says it is a sign to the unbelievers. That's true. Uh, Prophecy is not a sign to the unbeliever. Now, that doesn't mean that an unbeliever can't benefit from it if they happen to overhear it, or that tongues will always benefit unbelievers, especially when they come into the church and people are speaking in tongues, they're speaking languages that no one understands and needs an interpretation. Now, if an unbeliever comes in when you're doing that kind of tongues, they're not going to understand it because it's not a sign to them. You're not speaking their language. And they just hear babble, and they're going to think you're mad. Now, even though prophecy is not a sign for unbelievers, at least if they hear someone speak prophetically, they will understand it, and they can be convicted by what it says. Prophecy is primarily for the church, and as a sign, tongues is for unbelievers. But as an edifying gift to the church, with interpretation, tongues is something else, and Paul recognizes both. I think what he's saying in verse 22 is, although tongues is assigned to unbelievers, uh, obviously when you're speaking the unbeliever's language and they understand it, and they recognize that it's supernatural because you don't know their language, that's one thing. But if an unbeliever comes in the church, when you're all speaking in tongues, and it's chaotic, and they don't understand anything going on there, that's not going to be assigned to them. That's not going to benefit them. They're just going to think you're nuts. And I think that's what he's saying. I don't think he's contradicting himself if you understand that Paul recognizes more than one use of tongues and acknowledges more than one in this chapter. Three, to be uh, precise. Let's talk to Louise from Southern California somewhere. Uh, Louise, uh, welcome to The Narrow Path. Thanks for calling. Yes, thank you. Uh, You mentioned a word in connection with Chuck Smith's study that that you don't agree with, or I don't understand the word. I don't remember it right now. I heard you a couple weeks ago. It's probably the word dispensationalism. Okay. Yeah. Chuck, Smith is, Chuck Smith is my former pastor. I, I love Chuck Smith. Uh, when I was 16, I started going to Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa, and I sat under Chuck for the first five years of my ministry and definitely learned initially i learned everything i knew practically from him but of course a lot of the teaching at calvary chapel is about bible prophecy you know only a fraction of the biblical teaching in the bible is about bible prophecy but but uh, uh calvary chapel talks perhaps more about bible prophecy than even the bible does percentage wise and it's that portion it's that portion that i have come to see differently i'm not a, i'm not a dispensationalist anymore and and because of that uh i would differ from uh, the calvary chapel theology on that on on eschatology which is the study of end times now on most things i would agree with chuck smith i like, like i said i learned a great deal from chuck uh, when i was young and uh i think he was a pretty sound Bible teacher uh, on, on certainly most subjects, and he's you know he did a lot of work on Bible prophecy. He, I think, a lot of people considered him to be an expert on it. But a lot of people who are experts on Bible prophecy are experts in dispensationalism, which is a specific, fairly recent uh, interpretation of Bible prophecy, uh, which is very popular and. And it's it's basically, if, if you ever listen to Bible teaching that's uh, associating everything that's going on in the world today with the end times, then that's probably a dispensational teacher you're listening to because that's uh, not necessarily what the church thought through most of its history. But that would be the main thing. I, I think that Chuck Smith's teaching is very excellent on certainly most of the subjects that in the Bible that he teaches about or taught about since he's now gone to be with the Lord.
I agree, and I thank you. So it's primarily the prophecy that he stresses. Primarily his end times uh, interpretation. End times. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you, Louise. Good talking to you today. I only have a uh, about a minute before we're going to have to take a break at the bottom of the hour. We have some of our stations leave the network at the half hour point. The program goes on for an hour. That is another half hour. And if you are listening to a station that actually leaves the network at this point, you can hear the second half of the program by going to our website, thenarrowpath.com, where we stream the program live and we archive it for later. There's also a podcast and there's also our internet, uh, our, our telephone apps, uh, which you can listen to the program all the way through on those apps. And they are free, so you might want to check those out. The Narrow Path is a listener-supported ministry, and uh, we, we pay for the radio time. We buy the time on the radio. There's no one paid at the Narrow Path. I'm a volunteer. Everyone's a volunteer. Uh, we got a lot of people who volunteer, but nobody gets paid a penny, and no one receives any benefits. But we do take the money that is given, and we give it to radio stations so that we can stay on the air, and that's what we do. If you'd like to help us stay on the air, you can write to the Narrow Path, P.O. Box 1730, Temecula, California, 92593. You can also donate, if you want to, from our website, thenarrowpath.com. But thenarrowpath.com is a resource for you to take things for free. Everything is free there. Or you can donate at thenarrowpath.com. Please stay tuned. In about 30 seconds, we will be right back to continue the program for the second half hour. You are listening to The Narrow Path with Steve Gregg. The Narrow Path is listener-supported radio. After the show, we invite you to visit thenarrowpath.com to learn more. There are topical audio teachings, blog articles, verse-by-verse teachings, and the radio archives of all our shows. So when the show is over, come on over to thenarrowpath.com. Learn, study, enjoy. We thank you for your support, and we thank you for listening each day to The Narrow Path. We now return you to The Narrow Path with Steve Gregg. Welcome to the Narrow Path Radio Program, hosted by Steve Gregg. Steve is not in the studio today, so calls from listeners will not be able to be taken. In the place of the usual format, we've put together some of the best calls from past programs. They cover a variety of topics important to anyone interested in the Bible and Christianity. And now, please enjoy this special collection of calls to Steve Gregg and the Narrow Path. Uh, We're going to talk next to Daryl from Sacramento. Uh, Daryl, welcome to the Narrow Path. Hey, Steve. Uh, hey. Me. Hey, listen, um, I'm still stuck on the uh, issue of uh, the Bible's methodology for soul winning. Okay. I don't know if you've done this, but uh, we, we go house to house. I don't know if that's uh-huh. church to church or whether house to house was uh, ministry from one house to the next trying to win people to Christ. What is your take on I've that? I've done that. I've done that when I was younger. Yeah. I used to go to house to house. I went oh. house to house and witnessed. Sure, it's one way to get the gospel to the neighborhood. But uh, I mean, it just depends on how God leads you. It's not. There's not a command that you evangelize house to house. Now the seven, uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses say there is, because they uh, you read in Acts that they met from house to house. That is, the church met from house to house, and uh-huh. Jehovah's Witnesses mistakenly think that means that the the Christians went from house to house evangelizing, but it's actually yeah. talking about where the meetings were held from house to house. They, yeah. they met in homes. But, uh, yeah, there's no command in Scripture to evangelize house to house, but there's nothing to forbid it either. I'm not against it. And, and what about highways and byways? How would that be interpreted today? Well, the highways and byways is, is a term Jesus used in Matthew 22 when he was talking about the wedding feast that the, the first people invited, who were the Jews, uh, didn't come. And then he sent out his servants to the highways and byways, meaning out further away. Out, you know, that's like the highways were the the roads that lead to foreign countries and stuff like that. Uh-huh. So initially, that parable is saying that God first sent his messengers to the locals to invite them to the feast. That was the Jews, God's people, at the time. And when they rejected it, he sent his servants out internationally to the highways and byways to the other countries to bring in the Gentiles. Now, I don't think that, I, I mean, that's in a parable. That's not saying we need to go out and stand on the street corners or in the highways and, uh, you know, preach on the street corners, if that's what some people are, are suggesting. I mean, the parable is simply saying uh, 
instead of just reaching the local people of God, the Jews, uh, you're not, we're now commissioned to go out to all the nations. The highways and byways would not be the place where the evangelism is being done so much, but you'd be traveling the highways and byways to get to the places where the people are. I wouldn't, I wouldn't consider either you know, the house-to-house idea or the highways and byways to be telling us where to do evangelism, though I, as far as I'm concerned, you can do evangelism anywhere you are, and you could do that house-to-house. You could do it on the street, although I will say that evangelism on the street is often done in a way that I don't think resembles anything the apostles or Jesus did. Jesus and the apostles sometimes did preach in the open air, but they didn't just go out where there's a crowd uh, ignoring them and start shouting and getting their attention and uh-huh. annoying them. They would preach to a crowd that gathered to hear them. Jesus often had crowds following him around wanting to hear him, and he preached to them in the open air. We don't ever find him going someplace where people weren't gathered to hear him, and then he starts you know, preaching. There's one exception to what I just said, and that is at the Feast of Tabernacles in John chapter 7. I don't suppose the people were thinking about him during the ritual there, and he stood up and he gave a brief statement, said, if anyone thirsts, let him come unto me and drink. As the scriptures have said, he that believes on me out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. That Jesus did say on an occasion when people weren't gathered to hear him, but they were gathered for a religious meeting. They were gathered to, for a, a ceremony of the Feast of Tabernacles. But when you just go out in a place where people are doing business and stand on a street, street corner and start screaming out above the traffic noise, uh, a lot of people do that, and I, I just don't see Jesus or the apostles doing that. The only open-air preaching I actually read of the apostles doing was on the day of Pentecost, and that was when a crowd gathered because they heard people speaking in tongues. and thought, what's going on here? And a crowd gathered out of curiosity, just like the crowds that followed Jesus. They were curious. They wanted explanations. What's going on here? These miracles are going on. And often the, the performance of a public miracle is what gathered the interested crowd and then Jesus or the apostles would then explain the miracle and, and use that to springboard into an explanation of the kingdom of God and evangelize people. But uh, apart from times when people gathered specifically for, uh, uh, you know, to hear, we generally find Jesus uh, you know, talking to people who come to him individually or going into synagogues where, again, people were gathered to hear whoever was going to speak, and Jesus spoke there. We don't find them going out and intruding uh, very often into people's lives. Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't. I'm just saying we don't have a model for that in the New Testament. And what I what I have seen, a lot of times street preachers really get negative responses because people are just trying to mind their own business, and there's some they're screaming at them saying they're going to go to hell. Now, frankly, the screamer often feels like he's really being courageous and Christ-like, uh, and, and especially as, if these people, you know, curse him, or throw things at him, spit at him, uh, hold their ears when they go by, he often will feel, wow, I'm really doing the right thing because look how they're persecuting me. But in fact, they may not be persecuting him for Christ's sake. They might be persecuting him because he's being an annoying person. Yeah. And, uh, and and they would, they would do the same thing if he was preaching, you know, if, if he was selling encyclopedias in the same manner out on the street corner. You know, I mean, the truth is, the gospel should be presented to people who have some preparation to hear it. Now, we don't know who those are. You can speak to anybody at a bus stop about the gospel and find out whether their hearts have been prepared to receive it or not. But when you're when you're screaming out on a street corner, I'm not so sure that that's I haven't seen that to be that effective. And I, 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 to be quite honest, I think a lot of times the only thing it serves is the preacher's sense that he has done his duty at great cost to himself. And what a good boy he is. I really think that it's uh, it's better to communicate with people whom God has prepared and who therefore want to hear. And uh, you can you can test the water sometimes. You can ask somebody. Uh, you can introduce the gospel to somebody in a non-annoying way, I would think. And if they say, I don't want to hear anything about it, well, then my assumption is God hasn't prepared them to hear it at that moment. Maybe Maybe another time for them. But there are people that God is moving. And Jesus said, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. So if the person is not being drawn, they're not going to be able to be converted. And if they are being drawn, they're not going to chase you away when you start talking about God. I see. Well, thank you very much, Steve. Hey, God bless you, Daryl. Uh, I appreciate the fact that you're doing evangelism. All right. God bless you. Bye-bye.
And our next caller is Darren calling from Denver, Colorado. Darren, good to hear from you. Welcome to The Narrow Path. Hello. Uh, yes. I've got a uh, question which will involve a couple or a few scriptures. Um, and it's concerning, actually, uh, a denominational church that I've been acquainted with for some years now and I have um, worshipped with and studied with. Um, and it's the uh, Seventh-day Adventists. And I'm not sure what, what you feel about the, that uh, organization or whatever, but... Um, I have kind of sort of personally struggled through sort of trying to hash out whether I should or whether I shouldn't. Uh, and you probably know the point I'm talking about. It's one of the commandments, the Ten Commandments, the fourth commandment about the Sabbath being Saturday originally and not Sunday. And now, of course, the majority of the world Christian church of all denominations, Catholicism and, and the like, are Sunday keeping. And from my understanding from history, it is because of a persuasion of of uh, Roman Catholicism. But anyway, we could go into that or not. But um, in the book of Revelation, both in chapter 22, which chapter 22, he says, uh, blessed are they that do his commandments. And I guess, you know, the proper thing to do is to figure out what is it, what commandments is he talking about there? Right, and then, right. You know, blessed are they uh, that do his commandments uh, for they, that they may enter in through the gates of the city. And, and that would mean, in other words, they're part of the new kingdom in the earth. And are saved ultimately, and then chapter both chapter fourteen and twelve speak of, uh, and chapter twelve specifically says, "Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus." So they have both of those things. They have the testimony of Jesus Christ, the Son of the Living God, and they right. also keep the commandments of God. It says, you know, not necessarily of Jesus, which we know they're both in the same. Right. So you can see with my quagmire, I'm trying to say, why does the majority of Christianity? keep Sunday as sort of a holy day, and they actually do. I mean, they, a lot of people will tell me, well, I don't necessarily keep it as a holy day. I will say, yes, you, 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 certainly, you most certainly do. And then, well, 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 most Christians, I yeah, most Christians I know, yeah, most Christians I know, if they go to church on Sunday, they don't keep it as a Sabbath. I mean, the, the, main, the main description of the Sabbath is not that you go to church. The Sabbath is the day you don't do any work. And if you read this, the fourth commandment, it doesn't say anything about going to church. It does talk no. about not doing any work on the seventh day. And, of course, the seventh day is Saturday of every week. But most Christians who go to church on Sunday, uh, they don't abstain from all work. They, that's just a day they go to a Christian meeting. It's not a day that they abstain from all work. And, and frankly, I think it's legitimate to go to church every day if they want to. I mean, there's nothing wrong with going to church to a Christian meeting on a Sunday or a Monday or Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, or Saturday. In fact, the early church, according to Acts chapter 2, they met daily. They sat daily under the apostles' teaching and doctrine and breaking of bread and, and prayers, which is pretty much what you do at church. So the real question is not what day do you go to a meeting, because... You can go to a meeting anytime you want to. Frankly, the Bible doesn't give any commands about when you go to meetings. But the Sabbath law is primarily about not doing any work. Now, it's true, uh, most Christians don't observe the Saturday Sabbath, but they don't observe the Sunday as a Sabbath either, and Sunday is not a Sabbath. It is true the Roman Catholic Church, one of the popes somewhere way back there, did say something about, you know, Sunday is now the, the Sabbath day. But the Roman Catholic Church doesn't have any authority to say that, and it doesn't agree with Scripture. The Sabbath day is Saturday. But the question is whether Christians are required to keep the Sabbath. Is there a command in the New Testament that identifies Sabbath keeping as a Christian obligation? Now, you mentioned several verses in Revelation that talk about those who have the commandments of God and keep the commandments of God and do them. Uh, yeah, that's right. But as you said, which commandments of God? Now, Jesus gave in the Great Commission in Matthew 28, he says, go into all the world and make disciples of all nations. And he says, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. Now, there's a lot of commandments of God in the Bible. Many of them Jesus didn't command. For example, there's commandments to uh, make pilgrimages to Jerusalem, to the to the tabernacle at least, uh, wherever it would be, three times a year. But we don't keep those commandments. Jesus didn't command us to do that. There's commands that we should uh, stone to death our children if they curse us or if they are rebellious. Uh, Jesus didn't command that. Uh, I mean, there's, a lot, there's, there's 613 commandments in the Old Testament, most of which Christians don't keep because Jesus did not tell us to do so. Uh, but Jesus did tell us to do a lot of things. And what he commanded 
are the commandments of God for the new covenant. The commandments that God gave to Moses were the commandments of God for the old covenant. Now, a covenant is a contract. And if you enter into a contract with somebody, there's going to be stipulations on both sides. They're, they're supposed to do something and you're supposed to do something. But if you get together and renegotiate and, and come up with a new contract, well, there might be new expectations on either side. And there certainly are with the new covenant. For example, in Hebrews chapter 8, it says that the new covenant is based on better promises than the old covenant. So God's promises are different in the new contract than they were in the old contract. And also we find that God's expectations of us are different in the new contract than in the old contract. The old covenant uh, required animal sacrifices. Well, the new contract doesn't. God doesn't require animal sacrifices in the new covenant, which means, of course, that when we ask, what does God want us to do? We have to ask, uh, well, under which covenant are we talking about? There's only one covenant at a time, however. It says in, uh, in the eighth chapter of Hebrews, in verse 13, that where there's a new covenant, and there is one, it says the old covenant is obsolete. That is, God doesn't have two contracts simultaneously, or two covenants at the same time with us. He's, there was the first one, and now there's a second one. Uh, what God has promised to do is different in the second covenant than in the first one. Better promises exist in the, in the second one than in the first one, said the writer of Hebrews. But also the expectations on us are different. So the real question is, are we supposed to consult the laws that God gave to Moses in the first covenant, or are we supposed to consult the things Jesus said in the second covenant, the new covenant? Now, Christians have held through most of history, and I agree with this, that Jesus is the Lord that Jesus is the one who tells us what we're supposed to do. And so I look to the New Testament to find out what Jesus and his apostles commanded, and uh, that's what I consider we have to do. Those are the commandments of God for us in the New Covenant. Now, interestingly, there is no commandment to keep the Sabbath anywhere in the New Covenant. Uh, Jesus didn't command it. The apostles didn't command it. So for me to keep the commandments of God does not require that I keep commandments that Jesus and the apostles never commanded because they spoke according to the new covenant. And if I'm supposed to keep the commands given by Moses in the old covenant, then I have to, I have to go to the temple and offer animal sacrifices on a regular basis. And I have to give a tithe to the Jewish priests so they can, and the Levites so they can live. I mean, this is what the law requires. If we're under it, I don't believe we are. I believe we're under Christ now and not under the law. Well, the I, and I do understand all that. a couple of good points for sure. And I did certainly miss, miss ask the question or, or, you know, it wasn't about, of course, service and going to service and worshiping. It was about a day to rest and to observe the, you know, the biblical 10, Ten Commandment law. Now, it's, but, and I'm just going to really quickly say this. It's like an Isaiah, I think, and then Paul in the New Testament reiterates that he says the new commandment. God says, I will make a new commandment of them, or a new covenant, new covenant. Not according to the former covenant, but right. this is the covenant. I will write my laws in their hearts, and in right. their minds will I place them, or whatever, in the mind and the heart, in other words, his laws. Mm-hmm. So, yep. And then, and real quickly, in Isaiah, the 66th chapter, toward the end, about the middle of it, he begins to talk some stuff, and he says, uh, as the new heavens and the new earth which I shall create shall remain before me, so shall your seed remain. And uh, mm-hmm. all flesh shall come and worship before the Lord every new moon and every Sabbath day. So that's in the new no. earth and the new heavens. No, no, it doesn't say every new moon. It says from one Sabbath to another and from one new moon oh, okay. to another. Yeah. It doesn't say it'll be done on the Sabbath day or on the new moons. Actually, I don't think Seventh-day Adventists keep the new moons, do they? I'm not sure, sir. I, I really don't know. No, no, the new moon. The new moon is the first day of every month, and it's kept. It was kept under the law, in the same right. way as Sabbath was. So I do know Seventh Day Adventists keep Saturday as a Sabbath, but I'm not aware uh, if they keep the new moons. But I don't think okay. we're supposed to. I don't think we're supposed to keep the okay. new moons or the Sabbath because it doesn't say well, from. It doesn't say every new moon and every Sabbath they'll come and worship me. It says from one new from, moon to the next, and from one Sabbath to the next, they will worship me. What that means okay. is okay. not just on the Sabbaths anymore, but the whole no. time in between. From one Sabbath to the next is includes 
Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Those are all the days from one Sabbath to the next. And it's saying that every day from one Sabbath to the next. What it's saying is not that they'll be keeping the Sabbath. What it's saying is that instead of merely keeping one day a week, they'll be keeping all the days in between those days, too. So this is similar to what Zechariah says in chapter 14. Same way, right? (laughs) Pardon? I'm sorry? In a sense, the same way now, we should do the same thing. I I agree. I agree. I think think that every day is the Lord's day for the Christian. You know what? I have never, ever, I've read that a lot of times and used it a lot of times to say, look, that tells me if it's going to indicate the term, the Sabbath day, it must still uh, exist in the new earth. So I'm going to say that we, it's still in bed. But you put a whole new perspective on the way that it is actually written. You're exactly right. It says, from one new moon to the next, and from one Sabbath day to the next, shall all flesh come and worship before the Lord. That is wonderful. Right. Thank you. I appreciate that. Well, I appreciate your call. Thank you for calling today. Okay, sir. You have a good day. Bye-bye. God bless you, Darren. Thank you for calling. All right, uh, another Paul, this time from Kansas City, Missouri. Welcome to the Narrow Path, Paul. Thanks for calling. Hey, Steve. Hey, um, I was listening to your three views on hell uh, recently, and you uh, cited, I think it was Joseph Fair, out of the rabbinical teachings uh, that they had uh, a story similar to that of uh, Jesus, the rich man, and Lazarus. Now, you said you never came across that, but, you know, I'm kind of now, I'm up in the air about this, you, you know, in the teaching, at least that's what you said. I'm up in the air on the source of, you know, this story. But I don't know if you've found that source since you've taught that, but um, I'm kind of, kind of, a little kind of, um, I don't know, I guess miffed as like, you know, throwing that, you know, that, you know, story that Jesus gives. And if you could give me a chance to respond to you, too, before you, you know, go to the, you know, next call, just I'd, I'd like to just one more response on that if, sure. if there's a possibility. But Sure. But, well, um, let me just say about yeah, that story, the, the, the lectures you heard are many, many years old. Since that time, I did the research and wrote my book on the three views of hell. And I cover that considerably more thoroughly in my book, because when I was writing my book, I did far more research than I had done before I gave those lectures. And it was oh, true. Oh, good. I, yeah, it was true. When I when I done those lectures, uh, it was only a rumor I had heard that there were rabbinic stories that were very very similar to the story of right. Lazarus and the rich man. In my research, I found that virtually all New Testament scholars agree that that is the case. But not just one story, but the rabbis had several stories that had the, basically the same scenario that Jesus uses. Two men die, one is in hell, the other is in Abraham's bosom, and there's a conversation between them and so forth, and that these stories taught by the rabbis were not regarded to be true any more than Jesus' parables were considered to be true. They were illustrative of something. One of the sources I, I quote uh, in my, or that I cite in my book said that one university has something like 17 stories that have been collected from rabbinic writings that have this basic motif and this basic structure. And uh, you'll find that even people who are are totally committed to the the most traditional view of hell, scholars like Craig Blomberg admit that the story of Lazarus and the rich man was really pretty much something borrowed from rabbinic writings. So it's not just people who have alternate views of hell that point this out or use it as an argument. Uh, It's kind of a general... I didn't know it until I did my research for the book, but I I found that many, many scholars of very mainstream uh, traditional scholars uh, mentioned this, that, yeah, the story has many parallels in the rabbinic literature. So um, I I guess to kind of follow up question, and then then I'll let you go and appreciate your time. Um, Then, you know, obviously Tartarus, Sheol, the place of the dead, you know, the words, the valley of Hinnom, you know, talk, you, as you were talking about Jeremiah. So what actually then do you believe happens to, say, someone who rejects God their whole life and curses and spurns God? And, I mean, wicked men like, you know, I mean, who just, you know, killed millions and millions of people. I mean, some of the most heinous people on planet Earth, and then they die, and what, what happens to them? Well, you mean immediately or after the judgment? If you want to cover two of them, that's fine, if you feel like you got time, but if not, I totally understand. Well, uh, the reason I ask that is there's a distinction. For example, the story of Lazarus and the rich man 
does not describe anyone after the judgment day. It's describing somebody immediately after they die. And yet the Bible teaches that when Jesus comes back, everyone will be raised from the dead and there will be a judgment day. And then those who are not found written in the book of life will be cast into the lake of fire. So you've got, you know, the situation of the lost right after they die. You know, once their bodies are in the grave and until Jesus comes back at the last judgment, judges them and puts them in the lake of fire. You know, what is their condition there in the interval between death and the resurrection? And the other question is what happens to them ultimately for eternity? On the first question, we have almost nothing in the Bible except the story of Lazarus and the rich man. Actually, uh, there are a number of things in the Bible that suggest something about where Christians go when they die. But as far as where non-Christians go when they die, it's not really addressed at all in any direct passage of teaching, except very possibly in this one story where a man dies and is seen to be in the flames of hell. Now, if he is actually in hell, if this is a true story, then we know something about the situation, that those who are wicked go to be in flames to await the judgment, and then they're thrown in the lake of fire, which is something else. Now, if the story is not intended as a true story, if Jesus realizes that he and his listeners are very much aware that he's simply citing a parable that was used by the rabbis, that he's making a point, but the point is something other than the question of where people go when they die, and that does seem to be the case in the story. It is, its main point is not what happens to people after they die. The main point is that which is found in the last verse. If they don't re- listen to law and the prophets, uh, then they won't believe even if a man rises from the dead. That seems to be the, the lesson of the story, rather than giving us some kind of uh, authorized insight into what happens to people after they die. But if it is a true story, then it does give us that insight. If it's a parable, then we have to ask, how much is it really telling us about the state of people after the dead, and what is the point it's trying to make? So that's that's uncertain. But apart from that story, the Bible pretty much doesn't say anything about where people go when they die if they're not saved. But it does say that in the resurrection, all people will stand before the great white throne, and they'll be judged, and all whose names are not found written in the book of life will be cast into the lake of fire. Okay. So, so that's the part of Revelation. That's the part of Revelation. I know. I know you've in the past cited Revelation. Um, I'm trying to think of the term that you used. Uh, that there was a lot of that type of literature. So uh, apocalyptic, apocalyptic, you know, yeah, yeah, apocalyptic literature, exactly. So how do you distinguish if it's apocalyptic and it's you know the the real deal? How how do you differentiate when you're reading the Book of Revelation? Okay, this is you know apocalyptic. And, you know, how do you discern that maybe what Jesus is talking about, the great white throne of judgment, that that's some not, you know, some type of, you know, apocalyptic or, you know, right. different kind of teaching. I understand. Along that line. There's some type of new type of apocalyptic teaching. That he's right. I, I understand the question, and I don't have much time to answer it, so let me try. Apocalyptic literature in general is symbolic. It is, of course, based upon real scenarios. But they are described in visions that use symbols. For example, the devil is symbolized as a dragon. Jesus is symbolized as a lamb. Uh, A political anti-Christian entity is symbolized as a beast with seven heads and ten horns. These are symbolic descriptions, not literal ones. Now, of course, the realities they're talking about are real realities, literal realities. Jesus is a literal person. The devil is a literal entity, uh, and so forth. Likewise, the lake of fire, uh, there is a literal place. Apparently, the lake of fire. Now, the story is told in very symbolic terms. And I would say one reason we know the lake of fire and the judgment, the final judgment, are true is because Jesus talked about it also. For example, in Matthew 25, in the story of the sheep and the goats, we find Jesus talking about the final judgment and people being sent either into everlasting fire or into everlasting life, which resembles what it says in Revelation 20. And yet the parables are not apocalyptic. They are parables, but they are another way of getting a point across. I'm sorry, I, I'd love to go into this more, but as you can tell, the music's playing. I'm, I'm off of here about 30 seconds. But Paul, give me a call again. It's good to talk to you again, by the way. God bless you. You've been listening to The Narrow Path. My name is Steve Gregg. Our program is listener-supported. We stay on the air because we pay for the time on the radio stations. We depend on listeners for that. If you'd like to help us, go to our website, thenarrowpath.com, or write to us at The Narrow Path, P.O. Box 1730. Temecula, California, 92593. God bless.